to talking about categorical data. So far we've been talking about using numerical data for inference, but now we're going to expand that a little bit. We're going to talk about categorical data. We're going to use a hypothesis test for proportions and also the chi-square test for no, there's a chi-square test that's called the in test of independence and one that's called the goodness of fit. Here, it looks like my volume levels are a little high here. Let's try this again. Okay. No clipping. All right, no clipping. Okay. So, basically, I want you to understand after this lecture how our hypothesis testing and confidence interval process is applied to proportions instead of means. Because when you have categorical data, you end up with, uh, in some cases, proportions, whereas numerical data, you end up with means. So let's walk through and see how that works. So far, it's been means. But now, we need to expand our horizons a bit. There are many different hypothesis test possibilities. Here are probably the bulk of them represented. If you have, um, if you categorize the different kinds of hypothesis tests or inferential procedures that you can perform, based on whether each of the two variables involved is numerical or categorical, then you kind of get a two by two table. Now notice this doesn't explain everything. For one thing, it leaves out single sample situations. Although you can kind of just imagine that the first row is the single sample situation because there's, uh, uh, no, maybe the first column, sorry, is the single sample situation because there really wouldn't be a predictor or independent variable. So, if you've got numerical and numerical variables together, you're going to do regression correlation, which we're going to learn in a couple of weeks here. There is a way to do numerical variables predicting categorical variables. There's polytomous, polytomous, however you say that, regression, and categorical regression, and ordinal processes, and all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff uh, that we're not going to learn, and most of you will never learn, not even in grad school. Um, it tends to be pretty esoteric. Then, but then we have this situation where we've been focusing on our energy so far, which is when you have a categorical predictor, but a numerical response variable. So with a t-test, let's say a two-sample t-test, if you have a grouping variable that groups people into one of two groups, well, that variable is the predictor, and it's categorical because there's only two possibilities. If you've got an analysis of variance situation, then what you have is a grouping variable that groups observations anyway, maybe not people, but observations into more than, uh, well, two or more groups, uh, including three and on up. And so that predictor is a categorical variable. And in both of those cases, you need a numerical response variable because you need to make a mean out of it. You can't make a mean out of a non-numerical variable, so you need means for each group, right? Well, now we're going to work to this work for the situation where you have a categorical predictor and response variable. First, we're going to tackle proportion tests, and then later we're going to tackle the chi-square tests. <coughs> so, in this, we're going to start out with the situation where there is really no predictor variable. It's just a single response variable. And then we'll move on to where there is a predictor variable with two sample proportion tests. But let's start out with one sample proportion tests, which is a little easier. Now, to put all this kind of in perspective, uh, you can come back and look over this table later. I'm not going to dwell on it too long. I just want to kind, kind of let you see how far we've come. So, if you... Look down here, these, these are going to be the categories of stuff that we apply to our different tests. There's um, a dependent variable here, and then you've got the statistic of interest, and then you've got the, the point estimate in the sample. You need to know the statistic of interest and the population value that's being estimated. And then you've got a sampling distribution. And the sampling distribution, you need to know what it's a sampling distribution of, what its shape is, what its standard error, and what the expected value of it is with the null hypothesis. Uh, of course, with confidence intervals, the expected value is just the sample value. So with a one-sample mean test, like a, a, a one-sample t-test, the dependent variable is a numerical variable. The statistic that we're interested in is the mean, one sample mean, and that is estimating a population mean, mu, and we use the sampling distribution of all possible sample means if the null hypothesis were true, or if um, the sample was representative if we're doing a confidence interval. The shape of that distribution is a T-shape, which is basically a normal shape. And the standard error is the standard error of the mean. So SE sub X bar is kind of how I'm abbreviating that in this table. And then the null hypothesis value of the sampling statistics, uh, the expected value is mu zero is how we label it. And that needs to come from outside the study somehow, some sort of 
value. We're going to do the same thing with a one sample proportion test. When you have two sample means, the setup is really similar except that you have two population, or well, both population and sample statistics. <coughs> You've got um, a statistic of interest, which is mean one, and another statistic, which is mean two from your sample. And then here, the population value you're estimating is the difference between the population mean for group one and the population mean that group two, well, sample two came from. The sampling distribution is the distribution of differences between two sample means. The shape of that distribution, again, is a T-shape. The standard error is a standard error of differences. And the expected value under the null hypothesis of you know, the average value in that standard sampling distribution is zero if it's a null hypothesis situation. Of course, if it was a confidence interval situation, the expected value would be this. It would be your sample value. If you have three or more sample means, we're still dealing with a numerical dependent variable. You've got three plus sample means. And the population value we're estimating is the true variance between group means in the population. So the variance between the mu's, between the, the population means. Uh, the sampling distribution that we use is the sampling distribution of the mean square between. So the sampling distribution of the variance of sample means. So these are pretty much the same thing. This is just the sample version and this is the population version here. So our F is basically the sampling distribution of mean square between divided by mean square within, more or less. So I've oversimplified this a little bit. The shape of that sampling distribution is an F distribution shape. The standard error, kind of more or less, we don't really think about standard errors very much with the F distribution, although the concept is there. You could think of the standard error as being the mean square within, because it's the thing you divide by. And then the uh, null hypothesis expected value of F is about 1, more or less, so you're trying to find a stronger value than 1. Now we're into one sample proportion. And the big change is that our dependent variable is dichotomous. When you have dichotomous data, you can't calculate a mean. You need a proportion. That's about as good as it gets. Dichotomous data means each individual can have only one of two possible values on the dependent variable. That's dichotomous for you. So the population value that we're estimating, we denote that with just a P, usually a capital P. Sometimes people use lowercase. But P hat, P with the little circumflex uh, accent thing on it there. That's how we note that we have a sample estimate of this. So it's the estimated proportion. It's the, sam it's the point estimate of this. So our sample value is written like this. It's like X bar, but it's P hat. We really need to standardize our system someday for symbols. So there's a sampling distribution of all possible proportions, and that happens to just be a normal distribution. So actually there's argument about this. The textbook says go with normal. Some textbooks say T, like these other things. I don't think it matters very much. And the standard error of that proportion is a thing that you can calculate with a quick little formula. And then the null hypothesis expected value of the, of the sample statistic, the value we would expect on average to happen in our samples if we had infinite random sampling from the same population, is we call it P0, capital P0, because it's a population proportion. Now, if there are two proportions, everything gets carried out into the two proportion sense. This is kind of like a two-sample um, means test, except it's a two-sample proportion test. So this is kind of where we're sitting at right now, right? In this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, a test for one proportion, a test for a proportion coming from a single sample uh, that we have access to. So the proportion test, there are, there are various varieties of proportion tests. We have the one sample proportion test, we have a difference between two independent samples, and a difference between two paired samples. Now we're not going to do the difference between two paired samples in this class because we can only cover so much, but it's out there. It's not that hard to find. You could probably figure out how to do it now that you've learned how to do things in this class. You could probably find a textbook and work your way through it and understand how to do this thing. Most importantly in this entire unit is understanding when to do this. Everything else is just plugging in values. <coughs> and you know how to do hypothesis tests, so you can do all sorts of value plugging in. But the part that's hard is understanding what the data look like that would lead us to do this kind of a test. We do this when the response variable or the dependent variable is dichotomous, sometimes known as binary, which just means there are only two possible values. So male, female, as long as you're not recognizing uh, you know, the people who don't identify themselves specifically as male or female. 
Male, female is often thought of as a dichotomous variable. Anything that's yes or no. Did you go to the party? Did you not go to the party? Are you a Democrat? Are you not a Democrat? All these kinds of, anything that you just turn something into a yes or no question, it has become a dichotomous or a binary variable. It means there's only two possible outcomes. So here's some examples of research questions that would lead us to do a proportion test. Has the rate of complaints against police officers increased? This implies that there is a former proportion of uh, complaints for every interaction or for every police officer or something like that. But rate implies that each individual either has the thing or doesn't, and then the rate is the percentage of individuals who have the thing. So the individuals could be individual interactions or calls or something, or they could be individual officers. But the point is it's a rate. And so you're going to end up with a proportion, because each individual can only have one of two values, either yes, there's a complaint, or no, there's not a complaint. Which school has a higher turnout for basketball games? So when you're, this might not seem so, so proportionate, but if you think about it, each individual here can either show up to a basketball game or not show up to a basketball game. Now you could turn this into a mean situation where you had multiple games, and then there would be an average turnout per game per school, and then you'd have you know, an independent samples t-test. But if you're thinking just for one game, for instance, counting the number of individuals from this school versus the other school uh, who are showing up for the game, then you have a proportion for group one and a proportion for group two. This is a two-proportion test. Did more people pass my class this year or last year? Same idea. You've got two groups of individuals, and in each group of individuals, you've got a proportion the proportion passing this year versus the proportion or percentage passing last year. Did more students complete homework? That's supposed to be homework three or homework four. Same idea, proportion for homework three, proportion for homework four. What percentage of Americans go to college now versus in 1950? Proportion in 1950 versus proportion now. So these are two proportions. When Once you're just counting the number of objects in a bin or each individual has only a yes or no, either you're in the bin or you're not in the bin, in the category, then you've got proportion tests. So looking at the concept of a test for a single proportion, let's um, kind of do this a little bit graphically and try and relate it to what we've done before. So stepping back, when we have a t-test and you've got a numerical variable, let's say there's five people in your single sample t-test sample, you're going to have some null hypothesis implied mean. Now this vertical bar with the hatch marks on it is to say this is a dependent variable that's, numer that's numeric and it can have values that go from you know, a low value down here up to a high value up here. And I made it really simple so there's only like one, two, three, four, five, there's only six possible values here. It's extremely simplistic. But the point is, symbolically, I hope you can get what's going on. The variable that we're dealing with, the response or dependent variable in this single sample t-test situation, is numerical and so we can look at its value on a numerical scale here. So the null hypothesis has a particular value. In this case the null hypothesis says the value should be down about here and each individual in your sample has a value on that dependent variable. And I didn't worry about putting the value exactly on the little hash marks and that's cool. So each individual has some sort of value. This person's kind of in the middle, this person's a little low, this one's high, this one's low, this one's really low. And then you have a mean of the values of all those individuals. <laughs> Boy, that bar is really high above that axis. And so you've got that mean. And then you compare that mean to the null hypothesis mean. And you use the standard error of the mean to figure out whether that difference is you know, really big or bigger than you'd expect. But this is kind of the core of what's going on. You get a mean from a sample on a numerical variable. Each individual has a value on the numerical variable. And the mean from your sample is compared to the null hypothesis mean. That difference is what you're evaluating. Is that bigger than we would expect if the null hypothesis were true? So with binary or dichotomous variables, then you end up having to do a proportion test because you can't calculate a mean. Actually, you can in a certain way, but I'm not going to talk about that too much because it just confuses things. So let's say the null hypothesis is that the proportion of individuals in you know, your sample having whatever characteristic should be 0.5. Each individual can have one of two values. That's the nature of, dich of dichotomous data. Each individual case can only have one of two values, and you can only have one of those values. Either you're in or you're out. You are or you aren't. You're yes or you're no, that kind of thing. 
So this individual, their value is you know, A. They're an A person. This person's a B. This person's a B. A. A. B. 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 A. So we've got these individuals and each of them has a value. You just have to pick one of those values and as it turns out it doesn't matter which one let's say A, and say that's what this is a proportion of. So the null hypothesis says that the, in the population, the, a, the, the proportion of A's in the population, the proportion of people in the population who have category A, are, is uh, 0.5. So in our sample, category A is 0.4. Because we've got what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We've got 10. So we've got 4 out of 10. That's a proportion of 0.4 or 40%. Now, category B is 60%. We could do the entire test with um, counting category B instead of counting category A. It doesn't matter. But we might have to adjust our null hypothesis. Now, in this case, our null hypothesis is even, Stephen. It's 0.5, so we wouldn't have to adjust it. But uh, say our null hypothesis value was 0.2 or something. If we switched from using category A to category B, we'd have to make our null hypothesis 0.8, probably. Anyway, this, it's one of these situations where you can flip-flop it if you want. The key thing is to keep it straight. You have to flip, if you're going to flip-flop it, if you're going to choose category B instead of category category A, that decision has to carry through all aspects of your hypothesis test. You can't just make a decision here and then carry out everything the way you would have for category A. But let's go with category A. The null hypothesis says there should be 50% of individuals in category A, so our proportion, our sample estimate, is 0.4. Our null hypothesis says 0.5. So that's our difference here. And that's, that's the statistic. We divide that by the standard error of the difference, and we've got a, a Z. So another way to look at this is, are you in or are you not in? So you could take those 10 individuals, and you could say our proportion is 0.4 because of this. 4 out of 10 were in the category. 6 out of 10 were not. Do you understand how that's exactly the same as the previous slide? If not, uh, spend some time thinking about it because this is the same and we talk about these things in these different ways We'll say there's a di there's a dichotomous or a binary variable and this proportion of people had You know this option or this answer or this value on that variable or we might flip-flop and just say You know this proportion of people were this Meaning, you know, you're, you're kind of in the category and so then we have the same situation We just compare our observed proportion to the null hypothesis proportion We find out whether it's you know, too big, big enough by dividing it by a standard error of the proportion, and then Bob's your uncle. So this is all demonstrating that basic principle that the nature of the data determines the treatment of the data. You can't validly use a means test when what you actually have is proportions. If your data is binary, then you have to treat it as binary data. I kind of think of it as, you know, what if you were dating somebody who was really, really not very intelligent? You can't treat them the same way as if you were dating somebody who was like a super genius person. Binary data is kind of dumb data. It's just yes or no, one or zero, in or out. It doesn't have this range of nuanced possibilities. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's the same process. We do the hypothesis test the same. We have a null hypothesis about the true population proportion. We usually, now I'm going to get into the symbols and start being formal with the symbols a little bit. The true population proportion is usually called P with no special symbols over it. Like I said, some people do a capital P, some people don't. I'm going to try and do capital P in the lectures just to kind of make it clear what I'm talking about. The sample point estimate of P, of the population proportion, we call it P hat. So the... Uh, P hat means estimated P. And we're going to see this in regression too. The little hat means an estimated value. The sampling distribution is the sampling distribution of proportions of all possible P hats. Of all possible P hats that could happen with random sampling if the true population is big P, like that. So if the true population proportion is 0.5, you might end up with a sampling proportion or a proportion in your sample of 0.25 or 0.1 or 0.9 or 0.8, etc. So the sampling distribution of proportions is the same as the sampling distribution of means. It's just a different kind of sampling distribution. The shape of that distribution is normal. And the standard error of that distribution, well, there's a formula for the standard error of the proportion. And then the mean of that sampling distribution for hypothesis tests is just whatever proportion is implied by your null hypothesis. So just like a single sample hypothesis test, you have to be rational and thinking about wh what kind of a proportion 
would make sense as a null hypothesis. What are you going to test against? What's your devil's advocate hypothesis that actually makes sense here? And then the mean of the sampling distribution for confidence intervals, of course, is just p hat. It's just the sample proportion. It's whatever you found in your sample. So when we do inference for one proportion, we have these formulas. The z for our observed proportion, so this is pretty much like t observed, this is like z observed for proportions, is just your observed proportion minus the null hypothesis proportion, of course, because remember a hypothesis test is just the difference between an observed value and the null value divided by the standard error. So the observed value is our observed proportion, just whatever proportion is in our sample. The null hypothesis value is whatever hypothesis you have come up with by being a rational, intelligent researcher and knowing your field and whatnot. And you divide that by the standard error for of the proportions. So the standard error of proportions, the formula is much simpler than most of our standard errors. Well, definitely simpler than, than some of the standard error formulas we've seen. It's just your, your observed proportion times 1 minus your observed proportion. So if your observed proportion is 0.5, then that would be p time, it would be 0.5 times 0.5. If your observed proportion was 0.2, then it would be 0.2 times 0.8, etc. And you divide that by n. So we're going to use a z statistic, which has no degrees of freedom. But the degrees of freedom kind of sort of get plugged in here. So if you have a big sample size, you're going to end up with a bigger uh, number in the numerator here because there's going to be a smaller, or sorry, a bigger number of the total value because this denominator is going to be much smaller because the big sample size in this denominator gives you a small standard error. And remember, small standard errors are good because when we plug them in there, they make the overall uh, statistic a larger statistic, and it's easier to reject the null hypothesis. So n is incorporated in there. It's just not incorporated by using a t statistic. And like I said, other textbooks use different methods here. This textbook, pretty reasonable in my opinion. Not that I'm a statistician, but sure, why not? The people who wrote it are statisticians, so I'll trust them. Confidence intervals are always just an estimate from your sample, the point estimate plus or minus some z-like score times a standard error, right? Well, in this case, the z-like score is just z. So, for instance, if we wanted a 95% confidence interval, we just have the observed sample statistics, or so a proportion from the sample, plus or minus 1.96 times whatever this turned out to be, the standard error of the proportion. So this format should seem extremely similar to you, if it does, or familiar to you. If it doesn't, then keep looking at the slide, go back through the beginning of this lecture a few times until you start to see the pattern here. If this is not clicking, if this isn't making sense to you, keep going through it and thinking about it. Read the textbook until it, until it clicks, because this is just overlaying uh, a slightly different type of data on top of the procedures we've already learned. So we're going to go quicker than we normally would or than we have so far through the hypothesis testing, because I'm going to assume you know how to do a hypothesis test now. And we do that by stating our null and alternative hypothesis. We did our diagram. The diagram, it's just z. It's just a normal curve. We just draw a diagram for, just like for the z or the t test. We look up our z critical. We state our rejection rule. We calculate our observed z value. We state our decision about the null. We state our conclusion. Same process.